appreciate you coming on so promptly. Welcome to the Community Preparedness Winter Weather Preparedness Webinar for Community Leaders. The image on the screen is Times Square after a snowstorm with traffic lights and people are bundled up and walking in the streets. Our agenda for today is the introductions. I'm about to introduce our guests for today. I'll go over some objectives and a brief agenda. So here joining us for winter weather preparedness, we have Lenny James from the Department for the Aging, also known as DIFTA, about keeping older adults safe. And he'll also have an update about holiday meals from Get Food NYC. Cold related illness, be a buddy, and Department of Health updates regarding safety during the holiday season will be presented by Hannah Siegel from the Department of Health. Supporting the Vulnerable will be presented by Ron Spence from the Department of Social Services, also known as DSS. And lastly, we have our own fellow from the Community Preparedness Team, Sabrina Gibbs, to let you know what community members can do for winter weather preparedness. Our goal today is to provide winter weather safety information and community preparedness strategies to stay safe and healthy throughout the season. So what you can see in the photo that we have here are a bunch of cars on the street in a, after a big snowfall, and the person in front is trying to shovel out the snow from under the car. Briefly, for those of you who may not know us, uh, who we are and what we do, once again, my name is Jill Cornell. I'm from the Community Preparedness Team at New York City Emergency Management. And our mission is to help New Yorkers before, during, and after emergencies through preparedness, education, and response. The image on the left is of our office building at 165 Cadman Plaza West. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Lenny James from the Department for the Aging. Henny, Lenny, if you could, there you go. Yep. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Good morning, Jill, and good morning to all the other speakers. Um, so right before I start, I just wanted to go over the mission of the uh, Department for the Aging. And that mission is to work to eliminate ageism and ensure the dignity and quality of life of New York City's diverse older adults and for the support of their caregivers through service act, adv advocacy and education. So some of the things that the Department for the Aging do to carry out that mission is winter readiness to help seniors get ready for the winter, to help them get through the winter, and just basically those, those things in a nutshell. So some of the preseason readiness activities we do, as you see on the screen, we do a lot of testing. We do, we exercise our tests. We do a lot of training of our staff and we do um, a lot of our community partners. Um, you may know some of our community partners, our senior centers, our home delivered meals uh, programs and our case management agencies. Um, we do a lot of updating of our communication protocols to make sure that we're communicating with everyone in those loops. We refer to them as our stakeholders. That's our community providers, our seniors, and our staff internally. So the best preparation for tomorrow is doing your best today. So I wanted to read that quote to, to let you know this is why we do what we do as preseason preparedness. Next slide. Um, to continue with our um, enhanced monitoring, our preseason activation, and, and when I, and I not, I'm sorry, not preseason activation, but our pre-activation is when we know something is coming, we get a heads up from New York City Emergency Management through maybe a, a conference call, a winter weather conference call. So we start messaging to our internal and external partners to activate their pre-incident protocols. Um, in this instance, is winter weather protocols. So we also messaging to them any um, advanced warning system messages we get, and we like to keep them updated on any situational updates. So during the activation, we do a lot of monitoring of our partners for any service disruptions that they may need help with. 
And this in turn is how they are working with their seniors to help keep them safe. So some of our post activation is we conduct, we always conduct these after action reviews to find out what worked, what didn't work, where the gaps are. We identify those gaps and failures and we try to mitigate those things. Um, next slide. Um, before I go into this, I just wanted to, to note that now that we're in this COVID-19 pandemic um, atmosphere right now, a lot of our senior centers are closed for programming to our seniors. So we're, a lot of our senior centers are doing things like um, to combat this social isolation. they're doing things like virtual programming, they're doing wellness calls, they're doing friendly voices, they're calling the seniors, keeping them engaged. Some of that virtual programming can be virtual parties, virtual cooking, a whole host of things to keep them engaged. So I just wanted to point that out because I thought that was a very significant pivot that our centers and our providers did for the seniors. Um, our community providing this pre-storm activities also include messaging to older adults um, for preparedness tips and activities. As I explained, we get messages from um, the AWS, which is the advanced warning system that gives preparedness tips. It gives information on the um, storm and what's happening with it. And we send that messaging out to all our community partners and providers and in many instances to the seniors directly. Um, we always updating all communication platforms. That would be our social media platforms, our websites to keep everybody abreast. Um, one of the things, if you're looking for information on the Department for the Aging, you can also go to um, newyorkcity.gov backslash aging, and you will see a lot of information on the Department for the Aging and what we do. So during a storm, when we know a storm is coming, some of the things we do is we provide additional meals before the storm. So the uh, additional meals could be something as if, um, if it was our senior centers for say, our senior centers would provide meals the day before the storm so seniors wouldn't have to come out and get those meals. Um, our home delivered meals program would provide additional meals to the seniors so they could have meals throughout the storm. And that also goes, and we, we partner up with um, a few people in the community like City Meals on Wheels to provide, help us provide some of these emergency meals to senior centers and to home delivered meal uh, partners. So we do the same thing for holiday meals. We provide holiday meals to the older adults when the holidays is coming. We, did this, we just did it for Thanksgiving and we have our City Meals on Wheels partners help us with that as well. And the same thing will happen for Christmas. Um, Jill mentioned that um, Get Food will be doing holiday meals for the seniors in the city as of now because they're doing an emergency feeding program. So that's gonna happen. But I just wanted to point out some of the things that the P Department for the Aging does and we do provide those meals and we provide holiday meals. So again, I'm Lenny James. I'm the Director of Strategic Operations and Administration for the Department for the Aging. Thank you very much for your, t for your time. Thank you, Lenny. And please welcome Hannah Siegel from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Climate and Health Program. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to talk about how to stay safe this winter, both in terms of cold weather and uh, staying safe from COVID-19. So on the slide, we have a blue graphic snowflake on a white background. Next slide, please. So um, this winter, as we just experienced with Thanksgiving, there's going to be some fest holiday festivities and we want everyone to be able to celebrate the holidays in whatever way works best for you, but we also want you to do it safely. And as we just navigated with Thanksgiving, we have to navigate COVID safety protocols during the rest of the holiday season. So I'm going to talk about a few things that we, sh we recommend that you do, a few things you recommend that you avoid, and a few tricky situations that 
there's maybe a safer way to go about it or a less risky way to go about it. So first, uh, for the holidays, um, there's plenty of ways to have a very festive, fun time. So we recommend that you host a virtual party. You can still celebrate with family or friends um, virtually. You can deck the halls, put up as many decorations as you want. Um, you can walk around the neighborhood and view other people's decorations outside, um, even bring along some hot chocolate or cider to stay warm. You can spread holiday cheer, surprise neighbors with some uh, cookies or some, you know, nice gesture. Um, call someone you haven't spoken to, maybe someone from your office uh, who needs you know, who you want to reconnect with, but you don't necessarily work with all the time. Uh, you can still go caroling outdoors. Get music is a wonderful gift, and you can spread that around to your neighbors. You can play in the snow if we get some snow, build snowmen, have a snowball fight. You can still do holiday shopping online or using curbside pickup. If you do go in store, try to go during off hours and make sure that you're wearing a mask and staying socially distant. Um, you can still cook all your favorite holiday foods and you can watch your favorite holiday films or if you're not a holiday movie person, you can watch uh, football. And so here we have some examples of great ways to celebrate the holidays that will still keep you safe from COVID-19, which on the left we have two kids with uh, their Santa hats on, FaceTiming with Santa. And then on the right, we have a woman and her favorite ugly holiday sweater, which is a giant menorah, sparkly menorah sweater. Next slide. Um, so if you are attending religious services this holiday season, our advice is that you attend virtual services or have the services outside. You can see the top right photo, our people worshiping outside. They have candles and they have masks on. And um, it looks very festive and spiritual. Um, you can, you know, be prepared if you are going to a service, use hand sanitizer frequently and wear a face covering. And please spread out six feet from those who are not within your household. And if you are singing, we recommend you stay at least 12 feet apart. Um, also, if you're going to some sort of ceremony, please bring your own book of worship or ceremonial ob objects. Uh, for example, the woman on the bottom right looks like she's pouring, um, uh, she has an African kente cloth sash. Um, she's using Kwanzaa ceremonial items uh, and she has brought her own to this service. Uh, next slide. So we, we very strongly do not recommend gatherings. Um, we encourage you to party like it's 2020, which means going virtual. The reason why gatherings are risky is because it makes it very difficult to socially distance when you are indoors with many people, um, which increases the chance of spreading COVID to yourself or from yourself to loved ones and neighbors. And if you are eating or drinking, it's you cannot wear a face mask while you're doing that, which again increases the risk of spreading COVID-19. Also, um, just to remind you that even if those at the gathering are not presenting any symptoms, that those without symptoms could still have the virus and they can still spread it. Um, so we do not recommend gatherings. However, if you are gathering or if you are going to a gathering or you know someone going to a gathering, there is a way to reduce their risk. So primarily, we encourage you to know your own risk profile. Um, if you know you are someone with higher risk or someone in your family or others who are going to be there, we encourage you not to go or to attend virtually, but just know about yourself and know about others there, what their risk is going to be, um, if they're going to work or if they you know, have a chronic illness, that kind of thing. Um, please get tested before and after. The city has many free testing sites. You can go to the health department website to find one near you. Um, and keep it as small as you can. The more people there are there, the more likely someone there will have the virus and will spread it. So keep gatherings with those outside your household as small as you possibly can. Outdoors is always safer. So 
Hopefully the weather stays mild and we can keep congregating outdoors. Please just give, you know, a virtual kind of air hug. Don't um, keep your faces away from each other. Uh, and do not share food. If you are going somewhere where you will be eating, you can bring your own food. Dips are a big no this year. You can have your own private dip, but do not have a communal dip. Um, and then this image here in the middle, there's a hand near a bowl containing a, some sort of cheese dip, and there's a big red X across it. Uh, so next slide, please. Jill, you can go ahead to the next slide. I'm on it. Can you see it? Um, no, I just, I'm seeing the gathering slide. Mariah, can you see the slide with Santa and the sleigh at the top? No, Jill, it's still stuck on the gathering with the dip. Oh, something, something has gone awry with my, oh, it's paused. How do I, okay. Oh, I got it. Sorry about that. That's How about now? Looks good. Thank, Thank you. you. So, um, again, one thing that at the health department we do not recommend to reduce the spread of COVID-19 is travel. Please do not travel this year. If you are planning to travel, we encourage you to rethink that plan. Traveling is risky because it puts you and your family at risk of contracting the virus. And also, even if you yourself get the virus and you are you know, lucky to not have any symptoms, you could spread it to those in your community when you return or to another community that you might be visiting and cause a community outbreak. So, um, however, we do know that some people may be traveling regardless of this advice. So we do want to share some ways to reduce the risk. Uh, staying local, if you, you know, have an itch to go somewhere, I understand we've been staying home for a long time. You can travel locally, stay within New York. It's a beautiful state and there's a lot of things to see. We live in the best city in the world and you can do a staycation here. If you do travel, be very, very safe about it. Use hand sanitizer frequently and wear it face covering at all times. Um, if you're visiting family and friends, we encourage you to stay in a hotel room where you can have your own bedroom and own bathroom um, and bring your own food. Uh, plan ahead if you are traveling outside of New York um, and there will be drinking Make sure to have a designated driver if you are staying in a hotel room or plan a cab service or something like that. And most importantly, before and after travel, get tested and make sure you're following New York State guidelines for quarantine and testing. Current guidelines are that you should get tested 72 hours before entering the state of New York. And then once you return to New York, you should quarantine for three full days and on the fourth day get a test. Um, and the uh, test and trace service will be following up with you. And if you do not comply with that uh, guidelines, there is a fine. Um, and if you do not want to get a test then, or if you test negative, then you will have uh, be asked to complete a 14 day quarantine. And these guidelines are Put in place to keep yourself safe and to keep um, your family and community safe. If you're not able to quarantine safely at home, uh, there are uh, hotel services available for those who've been diagnosed with COVID and cannot isolate within their own homes. Um, and you can find that information on the health department website. Uh, so in this, um, this slide, we have a graphic of Santa with two reindeer and I like to joke that Santa will be the, should be the only person traveling this year. And even Santa is doing so uh, with COVID safety protocols. He is not with any other people. He's socially distancing. And um, I like to think that when he goes into people's chimneys, he puts his face covering on. Uh, next slide.
So now I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about another uh, health and safety threat this winter, which we see every winter, and that is cold weather. And cold weather poses a real risk to New Yorkers. On average, there are every year 180 emergency room visits related to cold weather exposure, and there are 240 cold weather related hospital admissions. And in the background of this image here, there are people walking all bundled up in front of a frozen water fountain. Next slide. Uh, so more, a little bit more about the effects of cold weather in New York City. Unfortunately, every year there are 15 deaths caused by cold weather, also known as hypothermia deaths. 75% of those who die from being exposed to the cold are ex exposed outdoors. 25% are exposed indoors, and that's because they may live in unheated homes, and this is most commonly in single and two-family homes. Um, we also see an increase in number of deaths from those who have chronic conditions um, where the cold weather has exacerbated their ex pre-existing condition. If you want to find more information about weather-related health our illness and death in New York City, we have a free data portal that has all of our health and safety climate information absolutely free for anyone to look at. And you can go to on.nyc.gov forward slash data portal. Next slide. So a little bit more, as I said, 75% of those who die from cold weather are exposed outdoors. This pertains mostly, mostly to those who um, do not have homes, who are homeless, and they are not staying in a warm shelter. Also, those who drink heavily or misuse drugs and may become incapacitated outdoors. Um, in this photo, you'll see a photo from a news source of two people who are in sleeping bags uh, on the sidewalk with a cardboard sign and a cup presumably um, without a shelter to stay in at night. Next slide. So, and uh, there's also a risk of staying indoors um, if people who do not have heat in their homes and then also have one or more of these traits. They're older, which older for New York City Health Department is usually defined around being 60 or over have physical disability or trouble leaving their home, have chronic health conditions such as heart or lung disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, or mental health or de de excuse me, de developmental disability. Next slide. So this is getting a little bit into um, the details, but bear with me, it's important information to know and um, it's something that hopefully will sort of stick into the back of your brain and you will recall it if the time ever arises. So I'm gonna go over the signs of hyperthermia and frostbite. And if you see any of these signs in yourself or in someone that you work with or a neighbor, please call 911 immediately. So the signs of hypothermia are intense shivering and not just like, you know, burr, I'm cold, but really intense and uncontrollable shivering dizziness, trouble speaking, lack of coordination, sluggishness and drowsiness, confusion, and shallow breathing. So if you are with someone outside or inside and there's no heat and you witness these symptoms, they're likely experiencing hypothermia and you should call 911 immediately. Um, also, a common illness experienced during extreme cold is frostbite. Symptoms of that looks like red and painful skin or very pale skin where the pigment has been drained from the skin, unusually firm or waxy skin or numbness. So if you see, you know, a change into the hands, if the hands aren't covered with gloves, tip of the nose or the feet, if feet aren't uncovered, you might see in those areas and extremities and you'll notice a change to the color or texture of the skin or numbness in those areas, and that my person might be experiencing frostbite, and you should call 911. Next slide. So 
how to stay safe outside this winter and prevent illness and death. Um, there's a few simple steps to follow. Wear dry, loose, co loose clothing that covers your skin. So as I mentioned, keep your hands and toes covered. Um, keep your face covered, which will be even easier this year because when we're outside, we'll be wearing face coverings to stay safe from COVID. So they have a dual purpose this winter. And go slow when you're walking on snow or ice. Take your time. Sometimes ice isn't always visible. Um, and if you have a car, make sure to keep snow and ice clear from your tailpipe so that when you turn the car, you do not expose yourself to carbon monoxide poisoning. And if you are shoveling your stairs or sidewalk, please just take it slow. Take breaks as often as you need and um, go at your own pace. And if you are older and or have a disability and you need shoveling assistance, you can call 311. The assistance is limited to certain geographic areas depending on staff availability, but we always recommend that you call and maybe there is someone available to help you. If you um, need or want to learn a little bit more about how to stay safe outdoors this summer, at the health department website, we have a really great graphic that's interactive and I have the URL here. Um, you can also go to the uh, health department website, which is nyc.gov forward slash health and search winter safety. Next slide. So here's some tips for staying safe indoors. As I expressed, 25% of hypothermic deaths occur from indoor exposure. Please tell your super landlord if you do not have heat. And if the problem is not fixed, call 311. And um, also you can call 311 if you need help paying your heating bills. I do recommend that when you're notifying your landlord about absence of heat that you do so either by email or text or a written note somewhere where there is a, a paper trail of your communication. Never run a car inside a garage. Always, uh, once you turn the car on, remove it from the garage immediately. And you can heat your home safely um, if your heat has been turned off and you're waiting for it to be turned on. Um, make sure that you're heating it with alternative methods safely. Make sure to have a working carbon monoxide detector and smoke alarm. Do not use your stove or oven to heat your home. And if you're using a space heater, plug it directly into the wall. Do not use an extension cord. Um, if you uh, have a baby in your home right now, make sure that they have a very warm and safe sleep environment, that they are wearing warm clothes and they're alone in their crib, no pillows or blankets. Um, if they do not have warm clothes and you do need to use a blanket, make sure that the blanket is tucked in and it is below the chin level of the baby. Next slide. So I see some people in the chat asking about assistance for um, heating the home. We, the New York State has a program called Home Energy Assistance Program or HEAP. You can apply starting right now um, and you may qualify if you pay directly for your heat or heat's included in your rent you're a U.S. citizen or you have other uh, um, citizenship status that, uh, that qualifies. Um, if one person in your home is under age six, over age 60 or permanently disabled, um, you meet the income criteria and just for time's sake, I'm not going to go over them, but I put the link here for you to find them for yourself otda.ny.gov forward slash programs forward slash HEAP, H-E-A-P. Um, also, if you receive SNAP, temporary assistance, or SSI code A, you would uh, meet the income qualifications. Um, HEAP does not just only provide uh, energy assistance, they also uh, uh, provide heating equipment repairs and um, they have a special form of assistance that's in an emergency shutoff protection. And so in this slide, we have a graphic of a, a little blue house. Next slide, please. 
So another really simple step that you can encourage people to take to increase winter weather safety is to be a buddy to friends and neighbors. Sounds simple, but it is a simple step that could genuinely save someone's life or save them a trip to the emergency room. If you know there's going to be extreme cold temperatures or a storm, you can check on those who uh, meet the risk characteristics that we talked about for hypothermia. Um, check on your friends, families, neighbors, and you, you, you might be the only person checking in on them, especially right now. People are a little more socially isolated and would probably really appreciate a virtual check-in. We do encourage, encourage virtual check-ins. You can call, text, slip a note under their door. Um, if you check in in person, make sure to socially distance and wear a face covering. Um, and if they do not have heat, when you check on them, you can follow the steps that I mentioned to help them get heat, report it to 311, contact their building super. Um, you can help them find a warm place. Maybe there's a church or house of worship that's open or some sort of business that they could um, go to. I know right now it is a little tough with Lenny said senior centers or libraries being closed, but there might be a warm place you could help them find. Um, I would encourage them to use electric, safe, electric space heaters safely. You can help them sign up for heat and help them dress warmly if they're not able to do so. Next slide. So the final a bit of safety advice that we have for you to stay safe this winter is to sign up for the advanced warning system notifications. These are free email uh, or text alerts operated by New York City Emergency Management who's hosting this webinar. And this is specifically for organizations that serve people with access and functional needs. The uh, alerts are extremely informative. You get one alert per emergency and it gives you all the information you need to know. We encourage all of our partners to sign up for this and I strongly encourage everyone on this call if you haven't already done so. It's very easy to register. You just go to advancedwarningsystemnyc.org and you can sign up and you can select types of events and locations um, that are relevant to you. Next slide. And that's all. Thank you so much for listening to the health and safety tips. Please stay safe and stay warm this winter. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hannah. And next we have Sabrina Gibbs, our fellow here on the, oh, sorry, we have Ron Spence from the Department of Social Services. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for um, having me on this very important winter weather preparedness call. Thank you, Jill, for coordinating this and fellow panelists. Um, there's a lot of very important information here. Some of it kind of carries over um, and is, there are dependencies between different agencies. So some of the stuff that I talk about, I'm not going to do too much of a deep dive into it since Hannah spoke to um, some components of that. But again, if you have any questions at the end of this, feel free also to reach out to uh, us at DSS. Um, so thank you again. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to give a, an overview kind of in three sort of sections. One is the services that DSS provides, give an overview of our organization, what makes us tick. Um, and then I'll go into a little bit of the emergency management programs and policies and projects that we uh, manage, not just internally within DSS emergency management, but across the entire agency. And then I'll uh, close it, I'll wrap it up with winter weather specific responsibilities that DSS has for citywide planning purposes and also for daily purposes such as code blue. So I'll start with the social services. Um, everyone here is familiar essentially with HRA, Human Resources Administration and the Department of Homeless Services. Just to give a, a quick sort of synopsis of um, a lot of movement that has happened over the last couple of years with both agencies. In 2016, there was a process of beginning to merge both agencies to make it unified under one umbrella under the new uh, Department of Social Services, which um, it's funny, social services used to exist, I believe, up until the early 90s, and it consisted of DSS, HRA, and ACS, and then it was broken up. But uh, since that time in 2016, 2017, 
based on the challenges and a lot of the overlaps between HRA and DHS, it was deemed necessary to integrate those since there were a lot of dependencies amongst uh, clients and also very similar operations that could benefit from one another. As you can see from the slide here, I haven't listed all the services that the agency as a whole conducts. As you can see, we try to categorize them as best as possible. Um, we have a 3 million clients in total that we provide services to. I know that seems like a lot since I think New York City's population is roughly 9 million New Yorkers. And so that's essentially a third of the entire city is either directly or, ind or indirectly dependent on DSS, whether on the HRA side or on the DHS side. And the reason for that is because um, for Social Security purposes, when individuals receive Social Security benefits, those have to get processed through the state as well and through the city. So there's a, a local component as well behind the scenes that happens. So we have a lot on our plate, especially when it comes to winter weather and other emergencies. But as you can see, we provide on a daily basis things such as um, financial assistance, um, SNAP, which Hannah uh, briefly touched on, the Supplemental um, Nutrition Assistance Program, which provides um, emergency feeding and, and food support as well. Um, job centers, employee services, and um, health insurance support, long-term care uh, services. Uh, we've seen the creation of, due to COVID, unfortunately, um, due to COVID uh, circumstances, we've also taken on more of a role of supporting um, families and individuals for uh, funeral services and such. Um, so we, we basically provide any sort of human service that the city of New York and New Yorkers um, need. Also on the DHS side, homeless services, prevention, uh, emergency sheltering, transitioning clients to permanent housing, and also daily outreach, which is kind of the core of the winter weather component, which I'll get into. Um, HRA has roughly a $9.6 billion budget. Um, DHS has roughly a $1 billion budget. Um, we have also roughly, there's 17,000 employees in total. The bulk of those are with HRA, roughly around 14,000 employees, and with DHS, roughly around um, 5,000. I know on the website currently it says 2,000, but we roughly have 5,000 if you factor in also, um, you know, uh, third-party contractors and also sort of support um, employees as well. Um, there's also the Home Energy Assistance Program, which uh, Hannah also uh, discussed, which, uh, you know, we support through also the state OTDA, Office of Temporary um, Assistance, um, uh, Disabilities and Assistance. So there's a lot within the, the scope of the agency as a whole, and that can also be challenging uh, behind the scenes to keep the, essentially the pilot light going during emergencies, whether it's just you know, direct winter weather, um, but when you factor in a pandemic, that can also complicate services. And right before I get into all that, I just want to mention that we're so big, we have two designated headquarters, one at Ford World, four World Trade Center and one at 33 Beaver Street in uh, downtown Manhattan. Next slide, please. So with emergency management, when I think what happens um, within the city and also possibly outside of working for city government, that when we talk about emergency management, I think people traditionally tend to think of whether, you know, FDNY, fires, EMS, um, you know, rescue, those type of things, or on the law enforcement end, emergency services, et cetera. Um, I think it's safe to say that every agency provides within the city, um, or at least a, a good chunk of the agencies provide daily emergency services that are not necessarily, they don't fall even into the buckets of traditional FEMA or Homeland Security emergency programs. But when you talk about emergency sheltering on a daily basis that we provide for the public, that, that is a crisis. Those are crisis situations that on a daily basis, we have so many great people on the front lines that especially in light of COVID that um, go out every day and they provide those serve, those direct services to the most vulnerable. So New York City, I think has really done a fantastic job of 
including DSS and HRA and DHS in their, the, the larger sort of contingency planning. Um, we're members of the Citywide Continuity of Operations Program. Um, as I said, since we have so many moving pieces, we have to make sure that there aren't any business interruptions or at least mitigate the possibility of that. Um, what was interesting with regards to COVID, the questions, uh, there were you know, surveys and questions that came up amongst different agencies in terms of have you prioritized services? Have you cut back on services? Have you sort of decreased the amount of services? And our answer was always no. And the reason for that is because there were services that we had, but they were changed up. So in light of COVID. So what we tended to do is we did an assessment of all of the essential services that the agency provides of those services, what have to be done in person, um, what have components of being done in person, and then what are things that can be, you know, done remotely whether on the client side, things that clients can work on remotely, whether paperwork that can be delivered to their home, mailed to their home, or on a computer at home or in a library, access to the internet. And then from a, an employee perspective, what are those business uh, processes and functions that we perform to maintain those operations that we can do remotely? So um, a lot of the agency is also working remotely, um, but uh, those haven't disrupted our services. I mean, we've done things also where for job centers, um, we've had drop boxes outside where individuals can hand in paperwork, things that have to be paper based, they can drop into a drop box, and then the employee on the inside can come out and then pick it up and bring it in. Um, we've also, our facilities group has done a tremendous amount of work um, with, um, you know, social, making sure that, that areas are, are social distance compliant, uh, protection screens, personal protective equipment, et cetera. So we've we've done a lot of work there, um, both at you know intake centers, shelters, employment centers, et cetera. We've also developed over the last since the, the merger, the the formal merger, which uh, was completed in 2017, started in 16, it was completed in 2017. There was the creation of what's called as the Serious Incident Unit, which is essentially, if you're familiar with uh, New York City Emergency Management's Watch Command operations and you'll see those alerts that come up this is kind of our in-house version of that so if there are emergencies that happen um, at shelters whether power outages fires um, even situations of um, if, if violence is an issue if there if there's other sort of needs even covid pandemic concerns those are constantly being monitored constantly being monitored by the agency so that way we can stay on top of it and manage it accordingly. Um, we've expanded pathogen planning and health and safety, which I've kind of uh, touched on. Um, we've been forward thinking in our planning as well, you know, making the assumption that um, even with the vaccines that are coming in, that we want to make sure that we don't take our eyes off the ball in maintaining those uh, things that worked to ensure mitigation of spreading of COVID and also of prevention. Um, as a result of, of working remotely, we've, our IT department has done a tremendous job of enhancing the resiliency of those critical business processes, whether issuing laptops and remote access from home, um, really trying to get line staff uh, kind of crash course in terms of, you know, working from home if, say, individuals are not used to working from home, if they're used to working in an office, that could be a big adjustment for folks whether on a social end or also just your daily routine. And I think it's safe to say that that's also impacted probably everyone on the call to whatever extent. But um, we, we tried to make sure that whatever sort of internal potential disruptions came up, that our staff had the tools ready to, um, you know, uh, face, face the, the situation. Has it always been perfect? Um, probably not, but I think it's also safe to say that we've all been in the same boat of trying to um, meet this sort of changing um, invisible threat. So um, I think in the long term, with regards to those resiliency components, whether in IT or even just our business processes that we provide to the public at large, um, once the pandemic ends, I think that services will become more streamlined to the benefit of the clients that need it the most. Um, so that's just one takeaway from that. 
The coastal storm planning we're, we're very heavily involved in where we manage a thing called the Shelter Command Center. And it's not specific to homeless um, shelters, but it's for uh, general public shelters at large of school facilities, DOE school facilities that get converted into temporary shelters for coastal storms. And um, those consist of schools that are designated as hurricane shelters, um, evacuation centers that people go to, to then get sent to different hurricane shelters. And then the Shelter Command Center, which DSS manages in partnership with about 13 other agencies, including DOH, uh, New York City EM, and others, um, we serve as sort of the mini emergency operations center that coordinates that field response and we report into the city's emergency operations center. So that's also a, a pretty tall order, but we've done some work again behind the scenes to make sure that we have the tools necessary to do things remotely if needed. Um, and then we're always building, working on that. Um, in addition to that, the agency has also put together a disabilities access and functional needs um, unit, which uh, specifically looks at addressing um, a couple of different lawsuits that um, the city experienced. One was specifically tied towards um, the hurricane that hit in 2012, Hurricane Sandy. And then also later on, there was a, a lawsuit called the Butler lawsuit, which basically was said that the facilities of both DOE and also uh, DSS needed to be more compliant with ADA requirements. So there was a whole unit designated um, and a number of different agencies, even at EM, um, and I believe also DOH, um, but also with us as well. And so we've looked at this holistically, working also with OTDA and also internally, what are sort of those additional contingency planning items that need to be considered for individuals with disabilities, cognitive needs, um, people that need additional support for an event, as well as for regular business hours and also 24 hours, those facilities, making sure that those are also compliant as well. Um, we've also done some work with the city's hazard mitigation planning, where we we're currently working on um, constructing a flood wall, flood barrier for the Borden Avenue Veterans Shelter in Long Island City, Queens, which was hit pretty hard by Hurricane Sandy. So that's in the pipeline. Um, I think COVID is probably going to move that back um, in terms of the deadline for completion, but the process is still moving forward. Initially, we were supposed to be completed by December of 2021, but that's probably most likely been pushed back, but we'll, we're going to complete that. That's definitely on our radar, and our facilities group has done a fantastic job of that, especially on-site, the program managers as well. Um, I've already touched on some of this, you know, other components, emergency sheltering, social services, and also security operations. Um, I just wanted to touch on that. We have security operations at both HRA facilities and also at DHS uh, shelters. Um, I'd say that the, I, I give them a lot of credit because the security operations um, are probably one of the most complex um, security type of operations within the city in that in a shelter, a shelter is a home for an individual. And the security officer, we have uniformed officers, peace officers, police force, and also we have contracted security. And they basically have to wear two roles. They have or two hats, rather, two different roles. One is to provide sort of that social service angle of policing, empathy, um, as well as ensuring that de-escalation techniques are um, implemented. And so um, I know, you know they've, they've, it can be a very stressful job. Um, and so my, my, I just have a lot of respect for those two operations in addition to the agency at large, because it's just not an easy job. But security operations, we've had the NYPD management team come in, assess operations to then uh, create a civilian um, department that is overseeing security and implementing a lot of uh, reforms that are going on currently within policing in general. And last but not least, which then I will dovetail into my next slide, is uh, Code Blue and Code Red Emergency Outreach, and uh, but focusing more on the Code Blue component. Next slide, please. 
So supporting vulnerable populations during winter weather conditions. Um, so basically with this, so there, there are two different things. One is code blue, one is code red. Code blue is for extreme cold temperatures, um, what we do with our outreach department and our shelters. And also code red is more for the summertime when there's extreme heat. And they're kind of mirror, they mirror each other in a sense for different seasons. So the, the process is very similar, but with different uh, tweaks for cold weather versus hot weather. For the purposes of this, I'll just jump into the cold weather. Um, if you see an individual who is homeless or that you may think is homeless that may need um, uh, non-medical assistance, uh, please feel free to call 311. Um, they'll route the phone call to our programmatic teams that are already pre-deployed uh, pre around the city. Um, the homeless individuals uh, will be assessed, um, taken to shelters or transported to hospitals. And um, due to COVID, what we've done is we've created um, a questionnaire that outreach teams will um, provide or rather ask um, the individuals that they meet with to ensure that if there is a possibility of someone coming into contact with COVID or if someone is running a temperature, um, then they'll be transported to um, an appropriate location, whether it's a hospital or another type of shelter. Um, the, co the code blue um, trigger points for this season hasn't changed with regards to COVID. Um, it's still, if it's 32 degrees out or below with factoring in wind chill, um, between the hours of 4 p.m. and 8 a.m. into the next day, we will activate code blue where DSS emergency management will send out an alert to individuals on our code alert list, which consists of both city agency liaisons and also uh, the uh, nonprofits, hospitals, and other partners and, and business partners that um, need that information. The coordination um, happens between 8 p.m. and the, even though it's called for 4 p.m. to 8 a.m., the, re, the operations don't start until 8 p.m. that night into 8 a.m. And the reason for that is to give the teams, the outreach teams, the ability to uh, coordinate their own internal logistics that are needed then to go out. And uh, statistically, the hours between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. during the winter months are uh, usually the coldest. So um, that's why th those teams are sent out at that time. Teams are sent out once they'll come into contact with an individual. Um, you know, they'll check in with them once every four hours. Um, if there's an enhanced code blue, which I'll go into in a moment, teams will go out once every two hours. So one is once every four hours, one is once every two hours. Excuse me, Ron, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, we uh, are very close to our ending time. And uh, I hopefully that this, I'm not sure with Zoom if they're going to end the webinar, but we will include your slide deck when we send it out. If anyone has any questions about the information that Ron has given us, please put it in the chat or, or in the Q&A, and we'll be sure to get that answer to you. I apologize, we have to move on because I think we're gonna get cut off at two and we have uh, another presenter. Okay, all right, yeah, if anyone has any questions about Code Blue, please feel free to reach out, thank you. Thank you, and also as a reminder for both, um, any information about Code Blue or about HEAP, the magic number for New York City is 311. You can get any information about New York City services by calling 311 or going online. And next, please welcome Sabrina Gibbs. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, all attendees and panelists. My name is Sabrina Gibbs, and I am a part of the Community Preparedness Team at New York City Emergency Management. And I'm happy to join in today to speak about our hazards, impact, and response for winter weather emergencies. Next slide, please. New York City Emergency Management coordinate citywide plans and city response. City, state, and federal agencies virtually staff the Emergency Operations Center to coordinate response. Activation can happen for snow accumulation, 
extreme cold, or other inclement weather. Agencies work together to monitor and respond to conditions by alerts and public messaging, snow clearance and towing, roadway and transportation system performance, infrastructure and utilities, human services, vulnerable population, and health-related issues. Next slide, please. Community engagement before and during emergencies. Our community preparedness team works with local organizations and networks to build their community capacity to prepare for, respond to, and recover from emergencies, including winter weather. The image description here is boxes of food in the background, a person carrying a box of goods and passing it, passing it on. Next slide, please. Your safety is very important. When a winter storm hits, be sure to be cautious and avoid slippery surfaces, wear sturdy boots for traction, use handrails when using stairs, heighten awareness of the cars, allow extra time for travel, keep your vehicle's gas tank full, and Keep a winter car survival kit that includes hand sanitizers and face coverings. The image description that you see here are three people crossing a street lined with cars on a snowy day. Next slide, please. So what can we do to prepare our communities for winter emergencies? The image description are two people bundled up walking in the middle of the street with cars on a snowy day, brownstone lines both sides of the street. Next slide. Before winter storms or extreme cold, as Hannah stated before, check on your neighbors. The image that you see here, a neighbor checking in on another neighbor. Check on your family, friends, and neighbors who may need help in the cold weather especially older adults or people with disabilities, to make sure that they are safe inside and have heat, especially if they need help getting supplies before the storm. Next slide, please. Share resources with your community. Sharing notifications from Notify NYC, AWS, which was mentioned before, Community Preparedness Newsletter, or the mayor's office, know how to submit heat and hot water complaints, know how to, to request emergency heating assistance, and how to register life-sustaining equipment. The image description is a thermometer in the snow. Next slide, please. While agencies coordinate a response for winter storm and extreme cold, Stay in, staying informed is important. How can you receive information? Notify NYC is the city's official source for information about emergency events and important city services. The advanced warning system proje projects emergencies information for organizations that serve people with disabilities or others with access and functional needs. New York City Emergency Management Community Preparedness distributes a weekly newsletter as well as important alerts and updates during emergencies. A traditional way that we all know about uh, is social media. We can use broadcast, radio, Facebook, Twitter, and even logging onto a website, nyc.gov slash severe weather. All of these are great to stay in tune during an emergency weather emergency. Next slide, please. During a winter storm or extreme cold event, we want you to shelter in place and heed travel bans. The image description here on the left is a child indoors during a snowstorm with a train set. And on your right, the image description is a highway with winter weather warning in effect sign during a snowstorm with cars. 
infant seniors and people with certain medical issues are at risk, are at increased risk of hypothermia and frostbites. Once again, check on your friends, relatives, and neighbors who may need assistance to ensure that they are adequately protected from the cold. If you suspect a person is suffering from frostbites or hypothermia, bring him or her someplace warm and seek medical help immediately or call 911. Next slide, please. Following a winter storm or extreme cold event, assess and report needs. The image description here is park benches with snow on them. You can call 311 to report dangerous conditions, down trees, electricity outage, heat loss, or if you see someone that needs assistance. Once again, we're emphasizing always try to check on your neighbors. Clear any snow and dangling ice from roofs, sidewalks, curb cuts, and hydrants. But if you are unwell, stay indoor and stay warm. Last but not least, refill your supplies. This storm may be over, but there most likely will be another one. So it is important that you always stay prepared. Thank you for listening and I'll be dropping in any resources that you will be needing. Thank you. That's great, thanks. Thanks so much, Sabrina. And uh, I apologize for going over. You're welcome to stay. We're gonna go over some of the uh, questions. We had a lot of questions, very active questions and chat. And hopefully our presenters can stay uh, as well. So some of them may be directed towards them. Mariah, do you wanna? So there was a very specific question asking what is happening in Diker Heights? Um, is there addi additional policing for the light shows? So I'm not sure if Hannah might happen to have any information. I don't think anyone on the call has it, but Hannah? Um, I do not have any information about Diker Heights or policing. However, if you are in the area and you want to go check out the lights, uh, which I recommend that's a great socially distanced COVID safe activity. Please wear a face covering and stay six feet away from those who are not in your household. Are New Yorkers being discouraged from using public transit during the holidays? Um, I can go ahead and try to answer this. I have not heard anything discouraging people from using public transportation. Um, if you are using public transportation, please, please, please wear a face covering. You are in an enclosed space with people likely not in your household. Um, but, and before and after you get on the train, we recommend that you wash your hands or use hand sanitizer. Um, socially distance to the best of your ability. Uh, but no, I've not heard anything discouraging people from using it. Thank you. And I know um, Lenny began to answer this question, but want to ask it out loud. Where do people go for homes who are unheated? Is there any emergency program to help them get a system in place? And I know there was some reference to the heat program um, to help in HRA and DSS. So Lenny or Ron, do either of you have more information for homeowners and tenants who may not have heat in their homes? They call 311. What else should they do? Um, this is Lenny James um, from the Department for the Aging. Um, during Hannah's uh, presentation, she spoke about the website um, that the state has for the HEAT program. So if you uh, go to her, one of her slides, you will see the, um, the, I think it's a link, but it's the web address is there. So that would be a good place to start. And she also pointed out some um, good tips other tips like uh, uh, maybe churches with warming uh, centers or space, calling 311 to let them know this is going on and to um, contact the landlord. So I thought those were very good tips. 
Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, I agree with Lenny. Uh, Hannah definitely had a lot of good information there. And um, if you if you are operating, I'll just add to that a community organization, or you have connections to the community, maybe through House of Worship. Uh, you can go ahead and start to think now um, about where safe space might be. Um, you can direct people to those safe spaces and be aware of if they are staying open throughout the winter or if they're closing or that kind of thing. Um, there might not be necessarily officially city sponsored spaces like a library, but there might be unofficial spaces like a house of worship um, or, you know, some sort of indoor shopping center or something like that. Thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you, Ron, and thank you, Lenny. Two more questions that we have. Um, one question is with regards to homeless patients, um, does DSS provide clothing for the homeless population during the winter? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know off the top of my head, but um, I can certainly follow up with a more specific answer. I, I don't want to give uh, an answer that's inaccurate, so I, I can definitely follow up about that. Okay, thank you. And for the person who wrote that question, I do have your email, so we'll be sure to follow up with you. Just give us a couple of days or possibly up until next week. Um, the other question that came in was, where can I get information on volunteer snow removal initiative that was noted in the mayor's press release? We need time to prepare, if possible, to organize a snow removal core in our neighborhoods. We're, we're want, we want to be ready for the first storm. So where can I find information to volunteer for snow, snow removal? Um, I can try to answer because I mentioned that you could call 311. I actually don't know uh, who who to contact. I know you, you could try 311. Uh, someone from NYSEM might know. Jill, do you know? Uh, well, actually, I got this question earlier from one of our attendees. And uh, I saw on New York City's website that this is something that's organized through NYC Service but I was also informed by our government relations team that it wasn't that active last year. And so there's new leadership. They're not sure about the status. And for community members, uh, always recommend if you have a communication system on your block, especially, uh, we have one on my block, we have a Google group. And uh, when there's a big snow event, we put out, does anybody need assistance? And uh, one or two people invariably say, yes, I need help. I'm at such and such address. And then a group of us usually go down and clear the curb cuts and um, the fire hydrants. So that's another, it's not an official way, um, but if you sign up to help through NYC service, you might get called to be in other locations other than your block. And that gets a little bit tricky if we get one of those big snowfalls where it's like 19 or 20 inches, it's a little harder to get around for, for a day or two afterwards. And um, I will that also that um, it doesn't have to be an official program as I mentioned and um, as Sabrina mentioned this concept of being a buddy it's just one-on-one -on -one interactions if everyone reached out to one person we would be so much safer and healthier and I also if you do have a group of volunteers who are ready to activate in the event of a snowstorm I strongly recommend you also activate your volunteer group to check on people during cold or other times. You don't have to wait uh, for a storm. Usually that's the time when a lot of people reach out, but there are other instances, for example, just plain cold weather that can be equally dangerous. And um, I encourage you to reach out regularly, not just during extreme weather events. Thank you so much. So again, take note, if you already have an organizations within your coordinated work together, if you're a homeowner, you need to go ahead and make plans as a homeowner, that is your responsibility. If you serve as a landlord um, for a couple of different buildings and properties, it is your responsibility to create a plan for the safety of all the residents within your building. Um, and lastly, a lot of people are asking, um, will there be, slide share will there be recordings yes yes and yes we will be sharing this information um 
in within the next week, we'll share the recording. We will also share the resources that have been highlighted. And there's one final question for DSS, and that is, um, is DSS helping homeless people um, with job security and finding jobs? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we have uh, programs in place at uh, different job centers. They call them job centers around the five boroughs that can assist with job placement services. Um, I'm more than happy to, to share uh, more information on that. There's a, on our website, there's a whole bunch of information on it. So I, I can certainly provide that either during this or afterwards if, if folks want uh, a direct email. Thanks, Ron. We will be sharing your email with uh, participants, but if you want to share me that, uh, share the website link, um, I can stick it in the resources file that we're compiling that we're going to send on with the recording. And actually, we're going to put it in our community preparedness newsletter. So this is a shameless plug for the newsletter. If you go into the chat, the link to sign up for the newsletter is there. And you can always email us at communityprep at oem.nyc.gov. And that's C-O-M-M-U-N-I-T-Y-P-R-E-P -M -M -E at oem.nyc. Hi guys. Okay. I'm sorry, Ryan. Go ahead. So that was it. I was just saying perfect. That's, that's the easiest way. All right. I just wanted to know, I know I saw a question about how um, someone could get involved with um, our social isolation um, agenda that we have going on with seniors. And I just wanted to say one of the ways is calling 311 but they, you can also call our Aging Connect line and they can directly lock, connect you into that. And that number is 212-244-6469 and it's in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Lenny. And thanks Ron and Hannah and Sabrina. We appreciate you sticking on and I apologize again for going over, but we had so much important information that we wanted to share with you that we're just really grateful that you were here to hear it and to share it. And we will make sure that you get the webinar to be able to share and also the wealth of resources that the city has for you. And remember two things from here. If you have any questions about city services, please call 311 or go online and please sign up for Notify NYC today if you haven't already done so. Have a great December and a good holiday to all who are celebrating. Thanks again.